Hello, good afternoon and a warm welcome to Bloxup Studio. My name is Penille and I'm your host today, welcoming you to today's science talk. Our science talks today is number three in our series of uh, healthy buildings, high performance, happy hearts and minds. And it is such a huge pleasure for today's science talks to welcome Finua Pin joining us from Reykjavik in Iceland. And I have looked forward to this day for a year now. As Finua will know, I reached out to Finua a year ago while Finua was very, very busy uh, co completing your research with Henning Larsen at DTU. And now you have moved on. You're doing your postdoc at the uh, University of Iceland. And you're, you've even founded your own company based on your research and what you've identified. So I just can't think of a more uh, relevant, the perfect speaker for our focus in the Healthy Building series on sound. And before I let you take it away, Finua, I want to welcome you our guests joining us from all over the world, I'd like to say thank you that you take time out to partake this journey of sharing knowledge and how we can solve the problems of uh, the buildings that come with creating healthy buildings. What do we need to address and how to uh, ensure healthy buildings? And thank you as well to our brilliant partners that are enabling this series of events. Thank you to Real Dania, thank you to Build at Aalborg University, Lutz Technology, PropTech, Danish Sound Cluster, and last but absolutely not least, Velux. It is such an honor to conduct this series and focus on ensuring healthy buildings. As we know, by this point, we spend 90% of our lifetime indoors. So we need to have a good environment. So Finua, I'm going to let you take it away. I can say many things, but for now, I will say thank you so much for joining us. And I look forward to talking to you after your presentation. Thank you and welcome again. Yeah, thank you very much, Penile. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all here today. Uh, as Penile mentioned, I'm speaking to you from Reykjavik, Iceland. I'm sitting here in the acoustics labs at the University of Iceland. And um, yeah, I think I'll just go ahead and dive right into the talk. I Let me try and share the screen here. So hopefully you see something now. So the title of my presentation is The Sound of Architecture by Means of Virtual Acoustics. In other words, I want to tell you about some fascinating digital technology, digital tool simulation technology that I and we have been researching and developing for the last five years or so uh, that has the ultimate aim of uh, making it easier, uh, more intuitive and robust to work with acoustics in building design and hopefully ultimately contributing to a better built environment. So I will just dive right ahead. Um, this is the outline of, of my talk. I will first talk a bit about sound in the built environment in general, just to sort of put us all on the same page here and. Uh, describe some of the problems that we're facing in this field. Then I will go on to talk about virtual acoustics or acoustic simulations, which is sort of my main field of, of interest and expertise. And then I will allow myself to go a bit into some details regarding the research that we have been doing for the last few years. Uh, not too detailed or too bad, I hope, but uh, still touching upon a few select topics. And then I will end up with some case studies where we have actually been using some of this technology that we've been developing in, in practice. Uh, but before I, I go ahead, just briefly about myself. That's me there, all photoshopped and <laughs> looking nice. Uh, so I did my PhD in acoustical engineering at the Technical University of Denmark. Um, this was an industrial PhD project, meaning a collaboration with an industrial partner. And in my case, that partner was Henning Larsen Architects. They are a building design studio with headquarters in Copenhagen and um, they're this very progressive building studio that is always on the lookout for new knowledge, new science, new technology that can help them uh, make their design process more sort of knowledge driven and, and science driven um, such that they end up designing something that not only looks good, they're very good at that by the way, but also something that functions well. Prior to my PhD studies, I was an acoustic consultant in an engineering consulting firm uh, for 
several years. Be, and actually, before I entered the world of acoustics, I was a software engineer at a large telecom company uh, here in Iceland. And these days, as Pernille mentioned, I am a co-founder and CEO of, of a startup called Treble Technologies. We are developing virtual acoustics software products aimed for, for the building industry. And I also hold a part-time research position at the University of Iceland as a, a doing research in acoustics. Okay, now sound in the built environment. There has been a lot of research done that has shown definitively that acoustics and the sound environment have a major influence on our health, well-being, performance, productivity in, in the built environment. A classic example is the open plan office, as we see here. Um, it's a tricky space type from, from an acoustical point of view, because on the one hand, you want to sort of promote knowledge sharing and teamwork, etc. And on the other end of the spectrum, you also want people to be able to focus and concentrate and solve complex tasks and so on. And this doesn't really go so well together uh, from a sound perspective. And in fact, one survey after another is showing something that around 70% of people are unhappy about their sound environments in modern office buildings. Similarly, in educational buildings, research has shown that uh, students, uh, they per perform better, they feel better, and they even judge their, their peers and their teachers more positively when the acoustics are good. Uh, in healthcare, uh, research has cor correlated uh, good acoustics with uh, less drug use, less cases of rehospitalization, faster healing, etc. Uh, outdoor noise. I myself have been more uh, concerned with indoor indoor sound or indoor acoustics, but outdoor noise in the built environment is no less of a problem. Um, and everything I will talk about today is, is more aimed towards the indoor environment, but it's e all of the technology is equally applicable to simulate and work with outdoor noise. And uh, regarding outdoor noise, for example, the World Health Organization says that, that um, environmental noise is the second most hazardous environmental factor after bad air quality. And they also estimate that something like one million healthy life years are lost every year due to noise in Western Europe alone. And last but not least, of course, concert halls, uh, cultural spaces, uh, music spaces, it's important to have good acoustics there too. Uh, this particular hall is called Eldborg. It's in uh, Harpa, which is a concert hall here in, in Reykjavik, Iceland. Uh, Henning Larsen designed and a very nice space, I, I must say. Unfortunately, I can't go there much these days, but hopefully that'll change soon. Okay, when we started this research uh, <clears throat> journey some five years ago, we actually didn't set out to, to develop technology or make simulations more accurate or, or faster or something like that, even though they kind of we ended up there. What we, end, what we started up uh, addressing or trying to think about was what can we do? Can we develop some tools or some methods or something that make sound become a more integral part of building design such that we actually shape spaces, do space planning, select materials, all with acoustics and sound in mind from the earliest sketches and throughout the whole process. Um, we want to acoustics, as I write here, to become a design driver in the process. And uh, this is what sort of led us to the development of virtual acoustics uh, and acoustic simulations. And we're trying to make it more easy and intuitive and flexible to work with acoustics. So moving on to virtual acoustics, uh, I say here that we're developing a new way of dealing with sound and building design. Uh, the long-term vision is that we want sound essentially to be a part of the 3D computer models that architects and engineers are working with every day, such that they not only see how their designs look, but they also hear how they sound. Ideally, there should be some interactivity involved in well, as well, for example, that you can walk around the space, either using uh, VR equipment as is shown here, or simply sitting at your computer uh, with headphones on, kind of like playing a computer game, and you can experience the space firsthand. You can maybe change the design on the fly and compare different uh, design options and hear the result uh, instantaneously and in, in a sort of holistic audiovisual virtu uh, virtual experience so you're not only you're not only thinking about the sound at one time only thinking about lighting at another time aesthetics at another but sort of more try to address this all holistically 
But if I allow myself to take a, a little step back here and just elaborate a bit further, uh, virtual acoustics or acoustic simulations, I sort of use these terms rather interchangeably. The process is illustrated here in this slide. We start with some input data. We have a model of the geometry in, <clears throat> in question. This can be an indoor space or an outdoor environment, um, along with some description of the acoustic properties of the surfaces in the room and the sound sources that are in the room. This input data is then fed to a simulation algorithm that computes how sound propagates in the room, how sound is absorbed, reflected, diffused, etc. There are many different ways of doing that, and I'll come back to that in a while. And this, this simulation then outputs some results that can take different forms. Uh, one form is some graphs and numbers that describe the acoustic comfort or the, some acoustic parameters. This is very important, for example, if you want to assess whether a certain design fulfills uh, regulatory requirements. This can be the reverberation time of a room, for example. Another way to, to investigate the results is, is uh, what's called oralization. That's basically to be able to listen to the simulated space. Uh, oralization as a sort of akin to visualization in, in, the, in, the, in the graphics world. And then yet another way is uh, to visualize how sound propagates in the room. And this has been around in some form for many years. The research topic started it in the 1960s, actually. But what we've been working on is both here, sort of the simulation aspect, developing new algorithm types that improve accuracy, that improve flexibility so that, so, so that we can do complex spaces and so on. And then on the other hand, also working on this results section here, uh, in particular, the listening experience, coupling the visual model with the with the acoustic model so that we see and hear at the same time. We can walk around the model, but we've also been working here on this visualization part two. And this sort of leads me naturally to these selected research topics that I wanted to tell you about. Um, I will give a short warning here before going ahead that the, the next, uh, shall we say, eight minutes of the talk are the most technical part of the talk. So if your background is not or or uh, simulation, for example, then it might get a bit too much, but I hope that you uh, hang in there with me. Uh, I promise there will be more fun stuff at the other end. Uh, well, I actually think this is very fun too, but uh, let's just uh, go ahead. So the first topic I wanted to tell you about is what's called wave-based virtual acoustics. So this refers to the type of simulation that we do when we simulate the acoustics in the built environment. There are many different ways of doing this, but they are traditionally divided into one of these two categories. We have the geometrical acoustics methods here on the right and the wave-based methods on the left. In geometrical acoustics, we employ a lot of simplifications or approximations to, to the simulation process. We essentially assume that the sound wave behaves like a ray that kind of bounces around the room following straight lines. The benefit of doing this is that this is a computationally very light process. We can do fast simulations. And so historically, this was an absolutely necessary approximation because we didn't have fast computers then as we do now. Uh, but the drawback of this approach is that a sound wave doesn't actually behave like a ray in reality. It behaves like a wave. And there, are, there can be, in certain cases, the accuracy can be quite low especially when we have wave phenomena such as diffraction. This, is, this means sound bending around corners, bending around obstacles in the room, uh, interference, sound waves meeting in antiphase and canceling each other out or meeting in phase and adding up, uh, scattering sound waves hitting a complex surface and being scattered in all different directions. These effects are not precisely captured uh, in, uh, in geometrical acoustics. In the wave-based methods, on the other hand, we actually solve the physics equations that describe wave motion uh, using numerical techniques. Uh, this way, we inherently account for all these wave effects and we can get very precise simulations if we have good input data. But the limitation here has been that these are much, much heavier computations than these here. Uh, so sort of in practice, they haven't actually been used that much. I myself have been much more in the wave-based part of this uh, world here, Try, and our research has been sort of towards accelerating wave-based methods, uh, improving them, making them more accurate so that we can actually use them in practice. 
and uh, I'll tell you briefly about that. Um, so one of the things we did at the outset of the work is that we teamed up with some fantastic mathematicians, both at DTU and also at EPFL in Switzerland. These are guys that have been simulating waves for, for decades, and uh, they um, and we basically asked them, uh, what is the best math numerical method that we can use uh, to simulate acoustics fast and accurately? And they came back to us and said, this discontinuous Galerkin finite element method is a long name, DGFEM, uh, is very well suited for the job uh, because it has these attractive features here. And so a lot of the research sort of in the early stages of what we were doing was adapting this numerical method to simulate room acoustics. Uh, this method has this geometric flexibility, meaning we can easily handle complex shaped rooms. Uh, it's very well suited for parallel computing, so we can simulate on large cloud computing clusters and speed up the simulations a lot. And then it has this last feature called high order accuracy. Won't go into the details of what that means. Long story short, it means faster simulations. So here we have an example where we're simulating a classroom. Uh, we record how long the simulation takes as a function of how high in frequency we go with the simulation. And we can basically go higher in frequency with a high order method compared to standard traditional low order methods such as the finite element method. And for example, here, if we want to simulate up to one kilohertz, this particular room with a particular computer we were using, uh, the, the improvement is quite significant. Okay, so that was wave based methods. And we're using them also, as you mentioned, to create, they're critical for creating realistic virtual listening experience such that we can actually use this in building design. Because in building design, it's critical that what we hear is very close to the real thing, as opposed to, for example, in video games, where maybe it's okay that things don't sound exactly as they do in the real world, as long as they're kind of impressive. Uh, so that's why we've been pushing for this wave-based approach and have got good results in that. Okay, next step is material modeling. Uh, materials, room surfaces, they have a huge influence on the acoustics of rooms. Um, and therefore, it is important to model these precisely when doing, when doing a virtual acoustics. And we, we zoomed in on a particular type of material, which is called porous materials. These are your mineral wools, your rock wool, your fiberglass, carpets, uh, curtains, etc. These sort of woven materials. Uh, as we can see, for example, here also the good old suspended ceiling, arguably the most common type of acoustic treatment in the world. This is a, a, a suspended porous material. This furnishing here, all, all porous materials. In wave-based methods, the way we traditionally have modeled room surfaces um, is that we employ what's called a local reaction assumption. That means that we assume that the interaction between the sound in the room and the room surface is an entirely local phenomenon happening at one point in space uh, in independent of other points in space <laughs> uh, and that is an okay approximation for, for a small subset of surface types but actually most surfaces exhibit this what's called extended reaction where there are actually waves propagating along the boundary of or inside the surface and that influences how uh, the surface absorbs sounds. And so we developed a way to model this extended reaction behavior in this DGFM scheme. Uh, and this is just a figure illustrating sort of what how we do this. So we have a mesh here of, of the room, um, and this is meant to replicate like a suspended ceiling. And we solve different physics equations here in the air, and then in the porous materials, we actually simulate the propagation inside the porous material and kind of couple that with the with the air domain simulation. Some example results here. Here we have a test where we have a sound source. It's shooting out a wave that hits um, a porous material, suspended porous material, and is reflected uh, of that to a receiver, just a single reflection case. Uh, and the wave is coming in at different incidence angles. And then what we compare here is uh, the sound pressure uh, across frequency. Uh, when we use either a local reaction assumption to model this uh, this material or our equivalent fluid model that's the extended reaction model and we compare that against an analytic reference solution which we know is the correct solution and what we see here is for the higher incidence angles the local reaction assumption basically breaks down whereas our extended reaction method closely follows the true solution here 
We also did some experimental validation using uh, data from a previous studies undertaken at DTU. This is a figure of their measurement setup. We have a sound source here emitting a wave being reflected off of the pores material and recorded here by a microphone. And we see that again, the sort of extended reaction method follows more closely the measured curve compared to the local reaction approach. Still some room for improvement, but, uh, but a step in the right direction. And uh, also there's some uncertainty, of course, involved with the measurement data itself. Okay, next topic, two down, two to go, um, high performance computing. This is this, these cloud computing systems, um, massively parallel computing arch architectures, they call it, such as graphics processing units, uh, GPUs. We can use these to accelerate our simulations significantly particularly if we have a, a method that can uh, that is well suited for parallel computing like DGFM is. Uh, so the way it works very briefly is that if we have a room here, we divide the room into different subdomains. Every subdomain is handled by a different CPU core, which is linked to a GPU that has thousands of cores. And then we simulate every element in this subdomain in parallel on the GPU. And very limited communication needs to take place here between the two. CPU cores. Uh, one example of a result here, um, simulating a particular case, then we saw that by going from a single CPU to a single GPU, we could speed up our simulations by a factor of 1600. So that's a uh, quite good uh, acceleration, I will say. And just to give you guys some numbers to the kind of ballpark figures of where we are, we are simulating large spaces here, 5,000 cubic meter, 20,000 cubic meter spaces up to one kilohertz. I think five or 10 years ago, there would be no way that you could simulate anything like this using a wave-based method. It would take days or even weeks. But here we are simulating it in around one hour using the, for, for the auditorium case and three hours using for, for the concert hall case. And I will also actually say that we've improved our code even further since we did this test. So uh, we can do even faster, but uh, yeah. Just to give you guys some some numbers here. Last thing, uh, interactive virtual acoustics. This is this idea of coupling the visual and the, and the audio, allowing people to explore the room and sort of holistically assess the quality of the design. It's very useful, for example, when presenting designs to people who are not acoustics experts, uh, clients, end users, other stakeholders. It's very good for them to be able to try and hear the difference. It's often those people who actually decide what the end sort of do we go with design A, which is okay quality, but costs less, or design B, which costs more, but is also better quality? Which ones should we actually go for? And is it worth it to go for the, the higher quality design? And then these, these technologies can be helpful, for example, in those types of scenarios. Overview of the system we developed. So we took an approach where we do sort of a pre-computation stage. This way we can use very accurate wave-based simulations to simulate the acoustics of, of, of the space. This is an example here. We have an office space. Uh, we sort of simulate the, um, the spatial impulse responses. So we encode spatial information using ambisonics across in a grid across the room prior to runtime and then during runtime the listener is kind of walking around the space and we're playing back the nearest files interpolated and decoding the ambisonics to get the right spatial feeling so that sound is coming from the right directions and so on in real time and we can switch between different design cases and so on uh, we did several tests of, of this uh, system of ours but uh, i'll just mention one here this is a test where we were ass assessing localization performance how well can people pinpoint in space where sound is coming from uh, compared to where we the true direction actually is and we uh, analyze this as a function of the ambisonics order and we present the stimuli under different conditions so we present only the sound then we present the sound and allow head movement so we have act headphones so we can allow the listener to move the head uh, we present the sound and the visual so the user sees the room and listens at the same time. And then we present the sound and the visuals and allow head movement. Did this for three rooms with different reverberation times. And um, at these results we see here are sort of averaged across these three rooms. And what we see in the results is that, uh, first of all, using second order ambisonics is better than using first order ambisonics. No surprise there. Secondly, we see that if we allow head movement, 
we drastically improve the performance. We lower the error of of the localization, pinpointing where sound is coming from. Uh, this is maybe also not a big surprise because it is it is well known that in reality, we sort of subconsciously do small movements of, of the head to help the brain localize where sound is coming from. Uh, interestingly, we also see that if we just present the visuals and play the head, play the audio, we improve the localization significantly. And I think this is a, an indication of the sort of power of VR and these immersive experiences because it shows that we sort of it's closer to reality. We perform better. We we experience the space more realistically if we have a multimodal uh, presentation of the space. And finally, if we present or allow everything, we get very good localization performance so people can really pinpoint where sound is coming from like they can in, in real life. Okay, that was the, the heavy stuff. I hope you're still with me. Now I will give you some examples of uh, where we've been applying this uh, in practice. The yeah, first I will say that uh, it's usually a lot of fun to allow people to try these things uh, because, um, yeah, it's a new thing and uh, it, it, it has, in my experience so far, has been very positive. It's kind of been reassuring that that it seems to add value to, to the building design process. People can relate to, to what is being discussed and uh, take informed decisions and so on. So it's been a very positive experience so far. The first case I'll tell you about is this Uppsala City Hall in Sweden. It's a part renovation, part new build, uh, basically a large office building with some additional functions too. I was actually responsible for the room acoustics design of this entire building, but uh, the space that we were most concerned with was this uh, atrium space, this huge space. It's around 30,000 cubic meters, glass ceiling, hard floor, glass facades all around uh, so sort of a fairly tricky space so um, we set up a virtual mock-up of this space um, to both sort of try different designs and see how they felt and uh, uh, yeah where we could get put some actually some sound absorbers into that room and also to assess how far do we actually have to go in order for this space to be comfortable uh, so I will now show you a video demo of this space. Um, you, in the video, you'll see the user walking around the space, and with a click of a button, he can switch the acoustic treatment on or off. And you should hear, uh, it's meant to be listened to in headphones, by the way, uh, but you should be able to hear that it's more noisy, more reverberant when the acoustic treatment is off, and sort of uh, quieter when it's on. Now I will ask Mark to play the video, or maybe he's already playing it. Yes. There once was a young rat named Arthur who would never take the trouble to make up his mind. Whenever his friends asked him who he would like to go out for dinner, he would only answer, I don't know. He wouldn't say yes, and he wouldn't say no either. He could never let us make a choice. His aunt Ellen said to him, No one will ever care for you if you carry on like this. You have no more money. There once was a young rat named Arthur who would never take the trouble to make up his mind. Okay, so I hope I hope it got through. I've had sort of a mixed experience with playing these things through 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 different platforms online, but I hope you got the message and sort of see at least what it's all about. Uh, so let me skip that here. So one of the outcomes of, of this um, experiment was that we ended up designing these wooden frames uh, that were sort of integrated into every window frame here of, of the facade. And these wooden frames were perforated, and then there was sound absorbing material here behind the perforated panel. And I just personally think that this is a kind of a great example of, of what the outcome can be when, when acoustics are actually a part of the uh, design process, uh, something that both looks great and functions well. 
Okay, next case study. This is uh, this was for an architectural competition we did in Henning Larsen. So again, during my PhD time, uh, this was a renovation of, of an existing office building in Copenhagen. This is the atrium space Henning Larsen design that was supposed to be added to, to the existing building. But anyway, what we were concerned about was the office areas. So the client was quite concerned about the indoor climate and, and the acoustics in particular, they were going from sort of traditional old uh, closed office types to more open offices, and they wanted to ensure that there would be a good, comfortable environment for, for the employees. So as a part of the competition, we did um, a virtual mock-up of a typical open plan office showing our design proposal. And um, in the video, again, we'll see a video in a couple of seconds, uh, you'll see the user walk around as before. Now it's a bit more interactive. He can switch different components of the acoustic treatment on or off. For example, these dividers we put up and these glass dividers here, the ceiling material, the carpet on the floor, etc. So let's go ahead and, and see that. Yeah. Um, these videos are also available on YouTube. So uh, if, if the sound quality wasn't great, then you're, you, we, you, we can put the link up uh, and you can see how they, yeah, see them on your own time if you want. Another thing we're working on in collab, this is in collaboration with Henning Larsen. It's still early days, I will say, but uh, just wanted to mention it. Uh, this is sort of a, an outdoor noise analysis tool where we want to give the, the designer, the urban planners, the architects uh, sort of an opportunity to uh, analyze noise in real time as they design such that they can get in, in do interactive design and get immediate feedback on, on, on the noise effects of, of their uh, designs and sort of at least get them in the right direction of uh, doing something that, that, that helps mitigate noise and reduce noise. So this is a very exciting uh, project. And finally, this is the last project uh, or case study. This is also something we're working on now. This is uh, a collaboration with Echophone. Echophone is a manufacturer of uh, acoustic materials, acoustic absorbers, uh, ceiling absorbers, wall panels, etc. And they've actually had for a few years now a sort of a virtual acoustic sales tool. And the whole reason I mention this is just because I think it's a cool example of what virtual acoustics can be used for. Uh, so, so they have a sort of a wireless VR kit that their salespeople can take to clients or potential customers and uh, put on the VR equipment. And then the, the potential client can, can stand in in, for example, a sports hall or, or, or a classroom and sort of experience the space with and without a product uh, to, uh, to hopefully see and understand that uh, they help create a more comfortable indoor environment. And we are now working with Echophone on this to improve the sort of realism and depth of immersion into these virtual experiences by bringing in wave-based simulations and and detailed material modeling and so on to try and uh, yeah increase the fidelity of, of this experience okay um that's more or less it for my talk uh i wish i could say that i had done all of this just by myself but uh, that's far from the truth i have been for the past five years working with many great people uh maybe the main ones are mentioned here but there are even more many students that have collaborated uh, throughout the years and i just want to extend a great thanks to all of them, the team at Treble, 
the virtual acoustics group at DTU, in particular, Professor Chul Ho and Professor Allen, and PhD students Hermes and Nicholas, in Henning Larsen, Jakob, Michael, and Lewis, and many others have been a great help. Professor Jan Hesteven, a DPFL mathematics genius, who has helped us a lot, and uh, Runar at uh, the University of Iceland, Professor. And I'll just here in the end allow myself to mention that we in Treble are uh, looking for early adopters of our products and technology. So if you are potentially interested in, in any of this, uh, want to try it out or, or yeah, set up some, something that could be cool, uh, then by all means reach out to us and we will be happy to do something fun together. So uh, just thanks for your attention, everyone. And... Uh, Hope you, uh, you're more than welcome to ask any questions you might have. You're also very welcome to reach out to me on LinkedIn or via mail afterwards and uh, have, a, have you have your questions or comments or want to chat. I'm always happy to talk about acoustics. Not, it doesn't even have to be just virtual acoustics. It can also just be <laughs> real life acoustics and we can, yeah, I'm happy to answer anything. So thank you. Thank you so very much, Vino. I think it was... Uh amazing and 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 flabbergastingly interesting it's uh i i've i had so many thoughts going through my my uh, my head while you were presenting uh and part of it was brilliant brilliant okay can you go back and say it again brilliant now i get it uh, and i hope for everyone out there watching us uh joining us uh, during this science talk i hope you've had just as an amazing experience as I've had uh, over the last uh, 40 minutes approximately. Uh, it was amazing. I have, I have a few questions, but I'd also like to encourage those of you uh, joining us on, on, uh, on our stream, live stream, that if you have questions, please feel free to post them in the chat. I have a wonderful colleague, Hill, who is uh, in charge of the chat, so you're in such capable hands. So pose your questions, your comments, and I'll receive them, and I can uh, then pass them on to Fino. We are eagerly awaiting, uh, so feel free. I, I, I loved it, Fino, but uh, you know this, I'm a fan. Uh, I, I am a, a heart believer in, in science. I love this knowledge-based approach. Uh, I, I also particularly enjoyed uh, the team effort and kudos also to, to all the people that you've collaborated with. Uh, the application of advanced mathematics in order to simulate and actually be able to convey the mitigation and the, as you said, the sound, how it propagates. Uh, I think it's, it is a complex uh, field of knowledge which has had me thinking, is this why sound has not been the pivotal design driver in, in, in creating buildings? Do you, is, is there a reason why we have not been good enough at incorporating s sound as a, as a design driver, do you think? Mm, yeah, it's a good question. I think, I think it's a factor. It's one of a few factors or maybe even many factors. So. One is simply that sort of the awareness and regarding the importance of acoustics has increased dramatically in recent years and 20 years ago, maybe that wasn't really kind of a widespread, well-known fact as it is now that the importance of good acoustics, so that's one thing. I think there is also something regarding workflow and sort of collaboration between engineers and architects that there is some room for improvement there. Uh, that's a fascinating uh, topic, and but uh, and it's not just with acoustics. I think this applies to many different fields because building design is a very complicated task, and there are many specialists involved, and so on. So it can be a tricky thing to to get everyone's sort of interest and and, and needs incorporated into the design. But uh, and then yes, I have, I hope that these sort of tools will make it. Uh, more accessible and easier. A very important part that we have emphasized a lot, which I maybe didn't come so much into here, is also sort of regarding the, the, the flexibility and the speed of simulations. We're hoping that that allows specialists to give rapid feedback. You know, now it's very much too often, I think, that, you know, an architect has some design and is interested in is the sound performance okay or not, and he has to go and wait two weeks until he gets a response from a specialist whether that's the case or not. 
and this feedback loop should be two hours, you know, not two weeks. So and we're, I, hopefully the tools can contribute to that. Yeah, because I think you had that in, in uh, one of in, in part of your research based part of the presentation, just how you've been able to with the collaboration of the mathematical geniuses actually really to abbreviate the time factor so that you're now able to make the simulation uh, simulations much faster. And I, I was thinking mm -hmm. that that is obviously psychologically, it's always nice to get that in instant feedback. I have this idea, mm -hmm. how does it work? And not wait two weeks mm -hmm. because as, as you said, the building process is such a complicated process and, and time is also an element. I think there is a characterization mm -hmm. of impatience. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. I, I would agree with you on that. But I was also, mm -hmm. I was also thinking that with your one of your cases uh, with the real life uh, analysis that you're able to to literally get the the that instantaneous sensation. How does this work? Uh, which leads me to my next question because you also uh, in part of your presentation say this is an excellent tool for the client. Do we go this way or another way? Um, mm. But. In, in your mind, uh, and based on all of your experience, if we have to have acoustics as a design driver, where in the build, in the process of deciding to create a new building, who is the most important key actor in that process that should have acoustic as a design driver, where it should be top of mind constantly in the process? Mm. Yeah, so I think many acoustic specialists would like to be involved from the earliest stages. And I think this applies, like I mentioned earlier, this applies to many different fields. Ideally, everyone wants to be in from the from the first sketches, uh, all these specialists and so on. And then in many senses, I understand that. And I think that's a, a completely understandable uh, uh opinion or approach and before maybe before I actually worked with Henning was in Henning Larsen for four years I was in the engineering world and then I would have absolutely just thought that you know but after sort of being on the other side of the table my view expanded a little bit and I can also understand that maybe the designers want some basically peace to be able to uh, design creatively and not sort of be too interrupted by all the different technical details and so on so it's a bit um, yeah, it's a tricky balance, I would say. So ideally, I would be very happy if the architects can do some, or the early stage designs, they can do some informed things about acoustics, and then a specialist is brought on later to improve that further and, and figure out the details and all that. Mm. So I think that would be a, just, you know, consider, you know, a, a classroom or something. It's a mm. simple space, but we could do some small tricks in the early stages to make them much better like shaping the geometry a little bit better than just a box uh, and that doesn't really maybe require a specialist to do, to do all of those things and then um, yeah bring the specialist on later yeah and it's a very good point uh, I think and and based on basically as you say you, now you've worked in in uh, different sides of, of of in the value chain as it were in the process so you you kind of broaden your perspective so that makes perfect sense mm -hmm. and I would also yeah. I would assume that you know to to bring in the the design the acoustic experts later in the process, but not so late that you can't make alterations. So that kind of no, sweet exactly. spot of timing, um, and I think that is a very good point. Mm -hmm. The the one thing that I also pu was puzzled by because I read some of you the articles written about your research after you've defended your PhD, and some of these acoustic issues are actually from new buildings. So it's not, it's not from the old buildings that we're now using in different ways. It's actually also from some of the, the, new, the new buildings that we've generated. So, mm. so in, 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 your, in your mind or in your perspective, that balance that we actually have a lot of new knowledge, we have a, an amazing amount of awareness of the importance of light, and just how severely we can be impacted by bad acoustics. What do you think then goes wrong in the process when some of the new buildings that we have still suffer from very poor acoustics? Mm -hmm. Great question. Hmm. Just kind of thinking out loud here. I mean, um, I think like you say, you know, we've learned a lot and we're trying to do 
a lot of new things. So maybe 50 years ago or 30 years ago, we sort of just by luck kind of uh, designed things in a way that uh, sometimes worked very well. But now we're, for example, trying to incorporate daylight uh, and acoustics together. And sometimes those th things don't sort of work too well in harmony. For daylight, you want to have uninterrupted access or sort of free line of sight, for example, throughout an office space. Uh, but from an acoustical point of view, you want to, to block, uh, to put up some, some blocking to, to, to reduce yeah. the sound propagation. So it's, I think, with all this new knowledge, there also comes new challenges. And I think that can be at least a part of the reason. That's a very, very good point. And I like the dichotomy that you also raised from open working spaces, the open plan mm. office, that we, we, we want that from knowledge creation or knowledge sharing mm. and creative ideation processes. And yet so many mm -hmm. people actually suffer uh, and say that they are not thriving in these open plans. So I think it's, it, I think it's, you're quite right that we do have some, some dilemmas that come and challenges that come mm -hmm. based on our increased awareness. We mm -hmm. are, have wonderful uh, viewers with us, Finua. So I'm now gonna uh, let their questions be posed because, and thank you to, yeah. to those of you actually. Javier uh, Bonilla, thank you for your, there is a comment. Thank you, Finua. In many auditoriums, the sooner uh, than later an audio system will be installed, at least temporarily. Is it possible to include the behavior of an audio system in your simulations? In principle, yes. But uh, there is some room for improvement on the implementation of that as of now, I will say. But yes, it is possible. It's uh, there are some technical details there regarding the directivity of the sound system and so on that uh, needs further work, but uh, yes. And that's a very important point, like you say, uh, that the, uh, the sound system has a big influence on the whole That's a good experience. It's always nice to have, uh, have, have these great comments. And Marcel, I'm delighted that you're watching from Brazil. It actually makes Fino and I very, very happy. Uh, so, so thank you for, for that even. We, we feel you from afar. It's wonderful to have you with us. And then we have Sophie with a wonderful question. When do you think this approach and tools will dive into the transmission loss of building facades, mm -hmm. outdoors mm -hmm. versus uh, indoors? Mm -hmm. I mean, there is research going on uh, in that field too, and that is directly a, a sound insulation simulations would be directly applicable to these things too. So I think uh, that is something that we will incorporate in, in the products of travel and uh, is, yeah, so that you can assess the whole chain of acoustic matters, whether it's outdoor sound, transmission from outdoor to indoor, and then the indoor environment. So it's a very exciting field. Um, yeah. It's quite interesting. We, we have from uh, some of our uh, contacts in, in Germany, we know that they're also very focused on not just creating the sustainable building, the healthy building, but they also want to permeate those design principles to the community. So I think, Sophie, you're, you're tapping into something that is becoming more and more relevant and pertinent for, for property developers and city developers. So it's a, it's a wonderful mm -hmm. point. And mm. just to clarify, Sophie, you're joining us from LA. We just, we, hello, wonderful to have you with us. <laughs> really brilliant. And thank you actually for getting up early because there's quite a time difference. So I'd like to recognize that as well. You, <laughs> <laughs> just to go to the part of one of the things that you were also talking about, Fino, in terms of the material modeling. One of the things in terms of the fetishes within architecture and uh, as you're saying that the trends and, and we want to have light because we know and we want daylight, we know that is good. There's also been a design criteria of transparency that was uh, very popular. Mm -hmm. uh, but glass is, uh, bear with me my limited, but I have always been taught that glass is not a good material for, uh, for, for acoustics. And mm, when you mm. and, and you also address that in the case study from the um, uh, what, where was it uh, in one of your your case studies you actually had that was it from Uppsala with the atrium that yeah was quite, exactly there was yeah. a lot of glass and concrete exactly uh, exactly yeah because it's, yeah uh, I think it's an interesting comment it's actually something I hear a lot. Um, 
glass is obviously not uh, great for absorbing sound, but it's not worse than concrete or gypsum or something like that. So it's it's these hard materials or steel. They're sort of equally bad, I would say, roughly speaking. So um, it's yeah, it's about getting some of these sound absorbing materials into the room, yeah. basically. A and then another dimension is very important, which is the geometry. And that's a very underused parameter when it comes to acoustics, because almost always acoustics design and acoustics uh, treatment involves just adding materials to make the design kind of bearable. But ideally, we should also be shaping the geometry such that we don't actually need all those materials, you know, or at least less of them. Exactly, because that came through in one of your simulation videos. That that just mm. with with the geometry that the when you you took us through that simulation how sound mm. actually completely then more or less evaporated. So that's mm. a, I think mm -hmm. that is, I, I was, mm -hmm. we, should, we should build differently, away from the boxes and the squares, as it were. Mm -hmm. So, I'm just checking here. Uh, yeah, we're good. We, so, in term, because the other thing in terms of the materials, you say that steel and concrete and glass are equally bad, and it's not the case of where they even themselves out so it's not two negatives becoming a positive it actually gets it's it's they can't they can't absorb the sound and it also yeah. uh resonates uh, as i have been been told however yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the things that i've also the challenges or the dilemmas is that when you then design a space that can really absorb sound then it it loses some of its multi multifunctionality. Is that correct? I've I've worked, you know. Yeah. I, yes. I had, I had musicians in at some point in a building I used to work in to give us a, a spontaneous mm. concert as a surprise present uh, to mm. the people I was uh, running a workshop with. It's, and they mm. came in and they were saying, "Oh no, there is." <laughs> We really can't conduct. We can't. We can't perform here because the sound will just flat become flat. Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, when it comes to music, there are certainly different kind of criteria that we're looking after when it, in, in, in acoustics and music, in in sort of these nor normal spaces, building types, hospitals, schools, uh, offices, etc. It's almost you know, the more dampened the room, the better. There is some limit, you can go too far and then it feels weird. It's like yeah. someone is, you know, has hands over your ears. And particularly maybe if you walk into a large space and it's very damp and that there's some sort of cognitive dissonance there, you, you, your brain expects some sort of reverberation from a large space, but it doesn't really happen. So you can go too far, but sort of more, you know, you more or less, we can say that the more dampened, the better. But then again, to your point, when it comes to music, particularly sort of acoustic music or classic music, less rhythmic music, then it's very important to get some support from, from the space. Um, yeah. yeah. So when so, you did yeah. the, uh, the beautiful concert hall that you showed us from Rijker Week, where, and we were, I think there was, uh, if we'd been more in the studio and I'm standing here, uh, I felt the sigh from everyone joining us through our live stream oh oh a concert hall i think we all lo long for the days where we can go to a concert hall yes uh, indeed indeed yeah. but but your simulation uh your tool would that also contribute in ensuring the best acoustics in in that setting yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah. yeah just to clarify for those of you mm -hmm. watching it it can both mitigate but it can also make sure that the room actually functions to the optimal use to bring Absolutely. to bring forth the most beautiful sound. Absolutely. Okay, we have a wonderful uh, we have a wonderful uh, question from Hill, and you know Hill. So, and this mm -hmm. is uh, if you could w invite anyone you'd like to an acoustic virtual simulation tour, who would you like to take on that tour? A lovely question. Yeah, lovely question. Um, I don't know why exactly, but the first name that sprung to mind is uh, Björk, the Icelandic yeah. uh, singer. 
She is just very progressive when it comes to sound and incorporating sound in into her art. She's obviously doing music, but sort of mm. yeah, spatial aspects of sound. And she she's also working, I believe, in sort of immersive virtual experiences mm. with sound and yeah. so on. So I think uh, it could be cool to work with her one day on, on something. I, I agree. And she's not afraid to experiment. Yeah. Like she will push exactly. it to its yeah. ultimate boundary. Uh, Hillock follows up with that. Uh, which building would you love to make a simulation of? Also a brilliant question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people think of, when they think about acoustics, they think about concert halls. And that's been the focus kind of, or, you know, sort of the drive of, of where this is coming from has been for concert halls and music performance spaces. So that could be kind of a straightforward answer. Some amazing concert hall in 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 uh yeah in the boston or in amsterdam or these kind of legendary concert halls but um i think um i'm actually more interested in yeah what i've referred to as normal spaces kind of the 95 98 percent uh, you know of spaces that we're actually in from every day in every day and and yeah these large atriums for example these are very kind of impressive spaces uh and it's not uh, entirely clear how they should be designed from an acoustical point of view so on so i i very much enjoyed this Uppsala case for example those types of buildings i like i i, I was just thinking along your your uh, line of thought i think it's also where you make a huge difference positive difference impacts people mm. lives everyday lives positively mm. so i, I mm. can relate to that we have mm -hmm. from Marcel a, a beautiful question. You, you're getting a lot of praise in the chat, so I'm, I'm not going to read it okay. out. It's not good for your ego. I mean, it's we have to we have to kind of keep a balance. But suffice it to say, yeah. a, amazing amount of congrats and kudos to you from everyone watching. Marcel is asking, have you ever done this simulation at a museum? No, not yet. That would be very uh, interesting. Yeah, it would be very, very interesting. And then we have Eric asking, apart from congratulating you, uh, could you comment on the high frequency limit in terms of computational time? And there's a follow up yeah. question. Is there a limit for large environments as you spend more memory and time? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good uh, question. Uh, extending these wave-based methods, these high precision methods to cover the full audible spectrum of what we hear is still very difficult. So our approach here is that we employ the wave-based methods in the low and mid frequency range where all the most important wave phenomena I mentioned earlier, diffraction, interference, scattering is happening. Well, especially diffraction and interference. Uh, and then, when we reach a certain frequency we switch over to a geometrical acoustic solver and when then we sort of combine the two this is a bit technical maybe but we're we're sort of getting the best best of both worlds this way we get the accuracy we need from the wave-based methods and then we can employ the geometrical methods in the high frequency range where the ray approximation is anyway quite good and this way we get both speed speed and uh, and accuracy we can do the wave-based simulation yeah, into the, like I say, into the mid frequency range. If it's a very large space, then maybe 500 hertz. If it's a small space, then maybe two kilohertz, sort of, just to throw out some rough numbers. I hope Eric, that answers I the hope, question. I hope you were paying attention. And if you want <laughs> to to uh, to hear this tech, really complicated and and uh, technical research based knowledge. Uh, this live stream will also be published so you can always go back and get the explanations again because it is technical as you say Finor. Just mm. to as a as a final question uh, I following the the, tr the uh, Hillis track which building have you ever visited where you wished that you have been part of some uh, acoustic simulation before they finished it? Mm. Yeah, good question. Um, 
yeah, open plan. I don't maybe don't want to name names, but open plan. I've been in quite a few open plan offices where I thought to myself, I'm lucky I don't work here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so let, let's leave it at that. That's it. We'll, we'll be polite and be nice. Yeah. Listen, Finua, it has. Uh, I hope this is not our last time together. I hope that uh, either I will. Uh, visit the, the lab in Reykjavik, or you will visit us and uh, meet up with uh, all of your co uh, colleagues at DTU and Henning Larsen, et cetera. Uh, we'd certainly mm -hmm. like to invite you back. This has been absolutely brilliant and fascinating. To all of those of you that were part of this today, thank you for being with us. Thank you for asking questions and commenting. And I think every word of praise was so well deserved to you, Finua. It is amazing what you've done. It's amazing what your colleagues and you are doing together. I think it's a clear improvement to the buildings today and tomorrow and just absolutely brilliant. And thank you so, so very much. And thank you to those of you who joined us and we wish you a very good day wherever you are. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much.